May I speak in the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Nod and smile at me if you remember your last curate. Some smiling and some nodding going on, you know, the full-time one who was here um, not that long ago. Ironically, as most of you will know only too well, Helen went off to be rector at Minchinhampton, which was a small village about 10 minutes from where I used to live, and the church where I did my placement during my ordination training. Our paths did cross fleetingly for a few months when I was a curate in a neighbouring parish, and we smiled at the thought that it'd be quite funny if I ended up at Christchurch. I think she probably would be smiling now if she heard me saying this. And I mention it because that church in Minchinhampton will always, always come into my mind when I hear the gospel that I've just read to you. You see, from the outside, anyway, Minchinhampton is a very prosperous place. It's, kind of, um, it's the kind of place that is a little bit nicer than even the nice Cotswold villages that surround it. It's a kind of oasis of gentrification. And I suppose people think of it a bit like people from outside think of Harrogate. Oh, it's nice and posh there. It's a nice place to be. It's got nice shops, nice restaurants. Everybody must be quite fortunate. Of course, that's a bit of a simplification, isn't it? There and here, there are all sorts of people, all sorts of incomes, all sorts of needs. But it was the sort of character of what Minchinhampton was like that I had in my head when I sat on my very first Sunday of my placement. And I'd been told... On my first Sunday, I could just come along, sit in the pews somewhere, not worry about introducing myself to anybody, and just see what I thought of the church. So there I was, and I heard the gospel that we've just heard today. And I won't deny that I looked up at the rector, who is an incredibly nice man and a wonderful priest, and with a wry smile, I thought to myself, preach yourself out of that one then. It seemed to me it was going to be quite an ask to reconcile the passage in which Jesus asks a man to give up everything and give it to the poor with the affluence I found myself seated in the middle of. And I was right, I suppose, but I was wrong too, because this passage isn't just about money. It's certainly not just a passage for those who, like the man in the gospel, we would call rich. It's actually a passage, I think, about how we should approach Jesus. And so also a passage about how we ought to approach God. The man who came before Jesus probably conjured up in the minds of those around him the same sorts of feelings and emotions that I had that Sunday sitting in the pews next to well-dressed and well-spoken people. He was a man of status, a man who probably expected to be treated with deference and respect. Mark doesn't tell us what he did for a living, but it's probable that he was the lawyer who prompts the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke's Gospel. And in any case, we know that he came to Jesus knowing how to talk to him. He wasn't somebody who thought, can I approach this teacher? He thought, I know how to speak to people. I've been well brought up. I know how to converse. I know what's expected of me. Good teacher, he says to Jesus. Good teacher quite a deferential address, a respectful one. But Jesus bats it straight back at him. Good, he says, don't call me good. Why are you calling me good, I suppose he's asking. It's the first step in what the passage is trying to achieve. This encounter reminded me of something, and somebody who was at the eight o'clock kindly left me in the pulpit a physical reminder of that thing from our harvest festival last week. Because this passage, I told those at eight o'clock without my visual aid, reminds me of an onion. And yes, I do mean an onion. Because an onion, as those of you who have them in the kitchen, might flake off those annoying bits of outer skin when you're unpacking them from the bag and drop them all over the kitchen floor. But actually, an onion is really tricky to peel. An onion has an incredibly good protective layer all around it. Unless you know what you're doing, it's a real pain to get underneath and to reveal the layers that lay beneath. And I think, when he approaches Jesus... Let me move that back there so I'm not worried. When he approaches Jesus, this man is a little bit like an unpeeled onion, with that skin very, very much intact. And you see, Jesus knows what that skin for him is made up of. He comes protected by 
propriety. He comes protected by status. He comes wrapped in what he ought to be saying, how he ought to behave. He knows how to address Jesus, and that's not it, because the next verse tells us he also knows all about the Jewish requirements. He knows about the law. He understands the Torah. And he's even kept those laws. He seems to have no doubt at all that he can meet the criteria of the commandments. Teacher, he says, I've kept all those things since my youth. It's not a small claim, is it? He thinks he's doing pretty well. He knows what he ought to believe. He knows how he ought to behave. And you sort of sense that Jesus looks at that perfect exterior, that correctness, with despair. And not a small amount of annoyance, too. Do you think that's how God wants you to be? Do you think that's how God wants you to come before him? Do you think that's what he values? The exterior compliance, the correctness, the outside skin. And then Jesus' attitude shifts. The conversation moves from being very dismissive and also quite formulaic, quite predictable. It moves from the outer skin of that onion into what's there underneath. And in my favourite verse, we peel off a layer. We peel off a layer of who this man is. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Jesus looked at him, and because he loved him, he said, let's cut through all this rubbish around the exterior. Let's talk about what actually matters, shall we? We both know what you're holding back from me. We both know what's stopping you from following me. We know you're focused on your wealth. We know you're focused on your possessions. Let go of them, and then let's talk. Let go of them, and then maybe you can come and follow me. Not judgment, but love. Sorrow at the place where the man finds himself, trapped by his things, encased in a shell of respectability and predictability and status. So what about us? Where do we find ourselves in that story? Well, whatever our bank balances are or aren't, in comparison to much of the world, we are rich indeed. I remember the very first time that one of my children said to me, Mummy, are we rich? How do you answer that? And I found myself saying, yeah, I think we are because we've got more than we need. And that's probably not a terribly bad way to think about wealth, is it? We are rich compared to so many. So I think we do all need to take quite seriously that verse that tells us how hard it is for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God, for someone who has more than they need and isn't sharing it to do that. But I think we probably need to think of ourselves as onions as well if we're actually going to take this reading seriously. Because some of us will look at it and say, well, I don't think I've got more than I need. Therefore, this isn't for me. And I think that misses the point. What protective skin do we put around ourselves when we come before God? We all know it, that we do it, don't we? We have a particular face that we present in certain situations. We have protective barriers and ways of being that we use when we talk to people. And I don't think that's always a bad thing. But how are we going to peel that away when we come to talk to God? How are we going to get rid of all the rubbish that surrounds us and of all those faces that we put on, those masks, so that we can actually get down to talking to God about what matters, not just going through the motions, but talking to him about who we are inside? Because he knows anyway, doesn't he? And he looks at us as Jesus looked at that man, and he loves us, not despite it, but perhaps because of it. So this isn't a condemnatory passage, I don't think. It's a passage of great compassion, and it's a passage of great hope. It says at the end of the first section, for mortals, salvation is impossible, but for God, all things are possible. All we have to do to allow that to be possible is to trust him to let go of that outer layer and to let him in to all that we are. Amen.